Good evening, good evening, good evening. <clears throat> Praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to our midweek gospel explosion, pastoral teaching. And certainly we thank God for each of you sharing your time with us on today. We do honor God who is sovereign and supreme to his son, Jesus Christ, who is Savior, Lord, and to the Holy Ghost, who is our comforter, leader, teacher, helper, and our guide. He who leads us in the way of all truth and righteousness. We greet you with Jesus' joy and certainly in divine love. Again, we thank God for you sharing your time with us on today. Today, we'd like to call your attention to the gospel according to St. Matthew's, that's St. Matthew's chapter 14, and we'll begin reading at verse 22. That's St. Matthew's chapter 14, verse 22. And if you're there, or when you get there, you will find these words recorded. And straightway, Jesus constrain or compel his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side, while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent the multitude away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. Verse 26. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth thou art the Son of God. Tonight we're going to deal with verses um, 22 uh, through uh, verse 29 uh, on tonight. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you now for this preaching and teaching moment. We pray now, God, that you release your power, your presence, your anointing upon this, your vessel that I may preach and teach with power and with clarity. Anoint each of us the more that we might hear, believe, receive, explore, apply, and share this word. Then we'll give you all of the honor, all of the praise, and all of the glory. For it's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. And every heart said, Amen. Well, tonight, uh, from... St. Matthew's chapter 22 through verses 29. We're going to speak from these words. Sailing or cruising without Christ. Cruising sound a little bit better. Cruising without Christ. Cruise simply means to sail slowly. And my brothers and my sisters, as we go through life, as we journey through life, 
as we sail or as we cruise through life, it's important and imperative that we do not do it without Christ. Make sure, I'm very sure, that Christ is on board of our lives, that he's the center of our lives. He's the head of our lives and the center of our joy. Because when we cruise or when we live this life without Christ, we will live a life in jeopardy. So as we look at the text on tonight, this cruise happened right after the disciples had been part of the miracle in which Jesus, our Lord and Savior, had taken only two fish and five loaves and fed 5,000 men. This very unusual cruise, and many of us, we like to cruise, uh, but we're talking about cruising, sailing, living with Christ. This unusual cruise took place on the sea of Galilee. The first thing I notice about this cruise was the sending of the disciples into the sea, or uh, sending them on the sea. Yes, after the feeding of the 5,000 men, Christ sent them on a cruise. This is what the text says. The text says in verse 22, and straightway Jesus constrained or compelled his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him. He constrained or compelled his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitude away. Uh-huh. Well, the question may be asked, <clears throat> and that is, why did Christ send his disciples to sea, knowing that there was a storm coming? Because we realize that Christ, who is God in the flesh, knows everything. He's omniscient. So he knew a storm was coming, but he sent his disciples into the sea, knowing that a storm was coming. And many of us will ask that question. Why? Wonder why Christ did that. Well, I think I got an answer for you on tonight. Well, there was a problem that prompt the sending of the disciples to the sea. They went, or they wanted, excuse me, to crown him. The people wanted to crown him as king only because Christ had put food in their mouths. Because Christ had fed the 5,000 men, the people, the multitude, the people around him wanted to crown him as king because he had put food in their mouths, not for spiritual reasons. My brothers and my sisters, hear me well. Crowning Christ as king because he could satisfy their need for bread was not the will of God at all. So, when Christ, our Lord and Savior, perceived that the crowd wanted to make him king, he decided, Christ decided to leave the area at once. You'll find that in John's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 15. Jesus knew that the storm 
watch this, that the storm that was brewing on the shore would be worse than the storm that was brewing or becoming on the sea. I say that again. Because you're asking, you're asking the question, why did Christ send his disciples uh, to, to the sea when he knew there was a storm coming? Well, the reason why is that Christ knew that the storm that was brewing on the shore would be worse than the storm that was becoming on the sea. So the problem produced the parting or the separation. Verse 22, I read it again. Listen to what it says. And straightway, here's the separation, the parting. And straightway, Jesus constrained or compelled his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitude away. Now, the first thing Christ did in regards to leaving the area was to order his disciples to go by boat or ship to the other side of Galilee. Now, this right here caused the disciples to be cruising without Christ. Uh-huh. They went sailing without Christ. Christ told them to get in the ship or into the boat and go to the other side while he dealt with the, the multitude that was there after the feeding of the 5,000. While he sent the multitude away, he sent his disciples to the other side of the sea. Are you with me so far? All right. Now, so after the after the problem, um, and after the parting or the separation, there was some praying. Verse twenty three. Listen what it says. And when he had sent the multitude away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. Now, why am I talking about praying? It's so important because let me ask this question. How important it is to resort to prayer when the crowd want us to do things contrary to the will of God. Now, the crowd wanted to crown Jesus Christ as king. And Jesus knew that that wasn't the proper time to do that. So my question is to us, how important it is to resort to prayer? Because Jesus went away to pray. After he dealt with the multitude, he went away to pray. And the text says in verse 23 that he was alone. So how important it is to resort to prayer when the crowd wants us to do things contrary to the will of God. You hear some people say all the time. And when you tell them what God's will is, that God, God wants us to obey him. We tell them that God wants us uh, uh, to give unto him. We tell them all those things, but you hear people say, I know that's his will, but they want you to do something else. Mm -hmm. So we see that there was a problem. The problem was that they were having issues with, 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 with crowning Jesus Christ as king. It was a problem. So Jesus sent his disciples to the other side of the sea and he went to pray. Mm -hmm. So now we, we see, we get the picture that his disciples has been sent to the other side. They got on the ship and now they're on their way to the other side. So after the sending of the disciples 
to the sea. The second thing I noticed about this cruise was the storm that appeared on the sea. After sending the disciples to the sea, the second thing that happened was the storm on the sea. Look at verse 24, the next verse. The next verse says, But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. Mm -hmm. So, hear me well. After the disciples had been cruising, after they had been sailing for a while, a bad storm came upon them. Now, the first thing that I noticed about this storm is the trial in the storm. In this storm that the disciples was that the disciples were in after Jesus sent them in experiencing this storm at sea, the disciples discovered that obedience to God is no exemption from the storms of life. In other words, when you obey God, sometimes you're going to be tested. Mm -hmm. So as they go on the sea, the storm comes. After they are obedient to Jesus the Christ, storm, the storm came. That lets us know that we are not exempted from storms in our lives. Though, 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 they obey, though they obey Christ's orders, still a great wind descended upon the sea. And as a result, the text, the text says that the, the boat was tossed with waves. Mm -hmm. The ship was tossed with waves for the wind was contrary. My brothers and my sisters, many winds in this world are contrary. Many winds in this world are contrary to doing the will of God. And we face them in our lives. Listen carefully. No one who sets out to do the will of God, our Father, will be long without experiencing. It won't be long without experiencing the trials of contrary circumstances. Are you hearing me? Contrary circumstances that will hinder and oppose one's obedience to God. The devil will see to it. The devil will make sure that you experience some contrary circumstances. So now, though plagued with contrary winds, the disciples did not quit. As many of us do in the 21st century church or the 21st century disciples. They did not quit. Mark 6 and 48 says they rowed continuously even though they were in a terrible storm. They rowed continuously. My brothers and my sisters, you and I, we are going to be tried and tested but remember this, don't quit. Hang in there, 
Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Don't quit. So, the first thing I saw in this stone was the trial or the test of the disciples. Second thing I noticed was the tranquility in the storm. So the trial in the storm with the disciples, now comes the tranquility in the storm. The calmness, the serenity. My brothers and my sisters, the path of obedience may be rough at times, but it will not lack the help of Christ. The trials, the testing may be severe, but it will not, it will not lack the help of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's see. Let's look at the next verse. Verse 25. Verse 25 says, they're in a storm now, remember? But verse 25 says, and in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the water. Mm -hmm. My brothers and sisters, Christ is the one who can bring real tranquility or real calmness or serenity in the time of a trial, in a time of testing, in a time of test. A time of testing, a time of toughness, in a time of torment. Christ is the one that can bring tranquility in those times. Of the tranquility help he gave, that he gave his disciples, we notice the assurance of his help. Well, Christ shows up. They're in the midst of the storm, but Christ shows up with tranquility. And we notice, first of all, of his tranquility was the assurance of his help. Look at verse 25 again. And the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the water. Now, Christ, our Lord and Savior, is always knowledgeable of our situation. Regardless of where you are, regardless of how bad things look, Christ, our Savior, is knowledgeable. He knows because he's omniscient. He knows everything. He knows our situation. He is aware of the storms that we face. And, watch this, if we are obeying his orders, we can back on his help for us. Christ even helps us when we have gotten ourselves into trouble by our own rebellious ways. So, in the midst of the trial. Tranquility comes because Christ comes. And we notice the assurance of his help. He gives us assurance that in the midst of our storms, he will show up. Second thing I want you to notice is try, as Christ brings tranquility. The second thing is the anxiety of his help. He comes with assurance, but I want us to also notice the anxiety of his help or the fear of his help. Not that Christ was fearful, but the disciples were fearful. They were filled with anxiety. Look at verse 26. Because Jesus comes to them walking on the water. Verse 26 says, And when the disciples saw him walking on the, on the sea, 
They were troubled, fearful, saying it is a spirit or it's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. He's coming to help them, but they are fearful. They are full of anxiety. Though Christ came to help the disciples, though Christ came to help them, they did not see help when they first saw him. Sometimes Christ is in the midst of our storm and he's helping us, but we don't see him. Mm -hmm. They did not see him at first. Rather, they were troubled, thought he was a ghost or spirit, and was filled, the text says, they were filled with fear. Hear this, my brothers and sisters. One or we can understand why the disciples were afraid. Before you talk bad about the disciples, you should be able to understand why the disciples were afraid. After all, Jesus did come to them and he was walking on the water. They had never seen anyone walk on water before. Although they knew or they should have known that Jesus the Christ was the son of God. Furthermore, they saw this phenomenon during a severe storm on the sea and at night. Now think about it. We see somebody walking on the water at night in the midst of the storm. We've never seen anybody walk on the water before. And here's someone walking on the water at night in the midst of the storm. Would we probably be afraid as well? Now, to think about it, the disciples, many of them were veterans of the sea. But they still was afraid. So, in the midst of their anxiety and apprehension, we notice the articulation of his help. Now, remember now, when Jesus shows up, we see the assurance. And I found out that assurance is better than insurance any day. He shows up and assures them that he's there. We see, we notice the anxiety. They are afraid. But now we notice the articulation or the, ex, the expression clearly. Jesus clearly expressed to them what to receive from him. And he expressed or he articulate why they need not be afraid. Listen what he says in verse 27. After they cried out for fear, the text says, but straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, be of good cheer, be not afraid. Wow. Uh -huh. Be of good cheer, be not afraid. Listen, listen carefully. Christ does not leave his own in such fear for a long time. I'll say that again. Christ does not leave those who belong to him in such fear for a long time. He will show up and he shows up and he spoke unto them. I say this all the time. When Jesus show up, he speaks. It is through uh, his divine word or through uh, a voice, he will speak. And he, so he spoke out to them, be of good cheer. 
It is I. Be not afraid. So notice now, it was the word of God that brought comfort to the disciples in the midst of their trial. It was the word of God that brought comfort to his disciples when they were experiencing jeopardy. When they were in trouble, it was the word of God. It is still true today. When we are sailing without Jesus and we end up in a storm, we always need to go to the word of God in the midst of our trials, in the midst of our tribulations, our testing, our torment. We need, if we want tranquility, if we want calmness and serenity, it's found in the word of God. So if we want tranquility in our trials, we need to get into the word of God. Now, after the sending of the disciples to the sea and the storm on the sea, he sent his disciples into the sea. There was a problem. There was parting. It was a problem because they wanted to they wanted to make Jesus king and he didn't want to do that. So there was a parting. He sent them to the other side and he stayed and took care of the multitude. And then he went to pray. The storm shows up. The storm was a trial. But Jesus came to them and brought tranquility. Brought them assurance. Mm -hmm. and to let them know that they didn't have to be filled with anxiety and he began to express to them to be of good cheer in his eye be not afraid so after all of that happens remember now I tag this message cruising without Christ so after that I want us to notice thirdly my third major point. Point number one was the sending of his disciples to the sea. Secondly, the storm on the sea. Thirdly, I want us to notice the supplicating on the sea. The request that was made while the disciples was on the sea in a ship, in a storm. Let's look at the next verse. This was a humble request or humble supplication by Peter. Verse 28. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. Mm -hmm. Peter, we call him Big Mouth Peter. Yeah. Now, hear me well. Peter's request or his supplication is most unusual and is often criticized. Peter oftentimes is accused of trying to be a show off before the other disciples and of requesting the unnecessary. But as I look closely at the text, as I examine the text, I discovered that this supplication of this request by Peter on the Sea of Galilee 
was a honorable request. Are you hearing me? Why do I say that? Well, hear me well. I said that because the first thing I noticed was the cause of Peter's request. The cause that Peter asked humbly, asked Christ humbly what he wanted to do. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come to thee on the water. The cause. Why did Peter make this request of Christ? I noticed three causes or three reasons for the request, I believe. First reason I believe Peter requested of Christ to come to him on the water, for Peter to come to Christ on the water, was the proof of Christ's identity. Peter wanted to know if the voice that he heard was indeed the voice of Christ. Well, I know what you're saying. Well, Peter should have known Christ's voice. Well, you remember now he's on the sea in a storm at night. So what would you have done? Before you talk about Peter so much. Because I believe that Peter did, did not doubt the power of Christ. His request reflected that fact. He didn't doubt the power of Christ. That's why he asked Christ that if it's you, bid me to come to you on the water. Mm -hmm. So he didn't doubt Christ's power. If it was the Lord, then Peter requested that, that the identity be confirmed by having Peter walk on the water. Wow. Peter wanted the proof of Christ's identity. Secondly, the second reason I think Peter made this request was because the passion for Christ's person. Peter made the request because of the proof of Christ's identity. Now I believe he made the request because the passion for Christ's person or the passion for Christ. Now, we know Peter. Big Mouth Peter, we call him. Peter the uh, denial. Mm -hmm. Peter had many faults, just like you and me. Peter had many faults, but lack of affection was for Christ was not one of Peter's faults. Not at this point. Peter greatly loved Christ and really craved fellowship with him. That's why we always seem to call him Big Mouse because he always spoke up. Peter loved Christ. So in his request here in the text, he asked Christ to come to Christ. Come to thee. Mm -hmm. He did not ask Christ to walk on the water. Not asking Christ Primarily to walk on the water so he could show the other disciples what a sensation of feet he could perform. He asked Christ to bid me to come to thee on the water. There's a difference. So now.
He didn't want to make the other disciples seem like he was a show off. He really wanted to come to Christ. So, 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 so he could be with Christ. He didn't want to walk on, walk on the wall just to show his disciples that he had something special. He wanted to walk on water to be with Christ. Does anybody just want to be with Christ? Day in and day out on a daily basis. Wouldn't that be great if all of our requests had as their aim a closer walk with Christ? That was Peter's. That's why Peter made the request. Because. He wanted to be with Christ because he had a passion for Christ. And when you have a passion for someone, you want to be with them. If you have a passion, a love, a compassion for someone, for your spouse, for your children, for, your, for, for, for whomever, your church members, you want to be with them. It's sad to say, but in this day, of, day and time, in this 21st century, there's not a lot of passion. Not just not for Christ, but not for each other. Ones who walk and talk with every day. So, the first cause that Peter made this request was because the proof of Christ's identity. Secondly, was because the passion for Christ's person. The third reason Peter made this request is because the protection in Christ's presence. Do you know that there's 24 seven protection when we're in Christ's presence? Now, let's look at the text. It had been a rough night on the ship. A rough night on the ship, on the sea, in a storm. For hours, the disciples had fought the storm to no avail. The severity of the storm threatened their lives. Now that Peter sees Christ and sees that Christ is near, he would like to be with Christ. For there is safety with Christ. I remember when, when I was a child and uh, when, when the storm started and the thunder and lightning started, we would go somewhere and sit down. And many of us, when we were, we were real young, we will we'll, 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 we'll humble ourselves and we'll hover around our, our mama. And, 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 and just, for, just because we believed that there was safety there. Mm hmm. So, 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 so Peter wants to be with Christ because there is safety with Christ. We are wise, my brothers and sisters, to seek the Lord in the time of trouble, in the time of trial. We will find a great refuge in the Lord. So, we notice there were three causes. And I got to hurry because I'm running out of time. Three causes for Peter to make this request. But not only were there a cause or reason for the request by Peter, but I also noticed the compliance in Peter's request. Mm -hmm. Now, those who criticize Peter's request need to recognize the submission or the submissive attitude in Peter's request. The submissive attitude. Peter said, bid me to come unto thee on the water. You see that? Mm-hmm. Now, when Peter said that, bid me to come to thee on the water, is not headstrong self-will. 
Peter's request left the walking on the water entirely up to Christ. He would comply. He would submit to Christ's wishes. He would not leave the boat until Christ told him to leave the boat. Are you hearing me? The submissive heart will keep us from much evil. So we see the compliance or the submissiveness or the submission from Peter's request. You see, my brothers and sisters, we all make unwise requests at times. But making a unwise, unwise request is not going to be a problem if the request or the requests are always made submissive or in compliance with the will of God. So, as I bring this message heard to a close, so because of Peter's request, the causes and the compliance, there was a commending of Peter's request by Christ. There was an entrusted mandate of Peter's request by Christ. In other words, Christ approved Peter's request. His approval is seen in his inviting Peter to walk on the water in verse 29. He says, and he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Christ. Wow. You see, come was Christ's invitation to Peter to walk on the water. Christ's come, or when Christ said come, plainly confirmed the request of Peter as being acceptable. Are y'all hearing me? However, it is true that sometimes God grant a bad request in order to bring judgment upon those making the request. In other words, sometimes God will give us what we ask for knowing that we don't need it to show us that we didn't need it. For an example, God did this to Israel. Y'all remember them? When they were in the wilderness and lusted after the wrong food, he gave them their request, but sent leanness to their soul. Psalm 106 and verse 15 talks about that. They kept asking for that which God had said they shouldn't have. God granted the request to chasten them. And sometimes God will do that to us. But Peter's request, his supplication was entirely different. He had not whined and pouted and insist on doing something Christ had plainly forbidden. He only asked once and it was completely submitted to the will of Christ. And Christ said to Peter, come. So my brothers and my sisters, when you are cruising in this life without Christ, when you are sailing without the Savior, and you find yourselves in the midst of a storm. The wind and the waves are tossing you from side to side. You may ask the question, what do I do? What do you do? Well, I want you to know tonight that you can make your request known unto Christ. He is only a prayer away. But make sure that your request is submissive, 
that your request is submissive to the will of God. When your request comply with the will of God, God will stamp you and stamp your request approved. Are y'all hear me? He will literally say, come. All that have labored and heavy laden, come, I will give you rest. I don't know about you, but I don't want to go anywhere without Christ. I don't want to cruise with, without him. I don't want to fly without him. I don't want to run without him. I want Christ to be ever present in my life. And most of all, when those troubled times come, I want him, when I make my request known unto him, I want him to stamp it approved. I don't know about you, but I'm glad I've been approved. I'm glad that I am one of God's children. I'm glad I'm a son. I'm glad that I'm the righteousness of God and I'm glad that I'm a friend of God because he calls me friend. I've been approved by God, the triune God. Sometimes I'm in a storm, but I've been approved. Sometimes I'm being lied on, being ostracized and criticized, but I've been approved. So if you have been, if you are going through this life without Jesus on board, what you need to do is to make sure and very sure that you connect with him and get back on board. If you're on board, stay on board. Don't let nobody, no kinfolk, no church folk, cause you to get off the board of this gospel ship. As the old folks used to say, the old ship of Zion, this is an old ship of Zion. Get on board and stay on board. Don't cruise. Don't sail without Christ. And if you do sail without him and find yourself in a storm, remember that the storm came to pass. If you belong to Christ, if you belong to God, the storm did not come to last. It came to pass. Although it may be severe, but trouble won't last. Always. And you can have confidence in that because you know that God has Stamp you approved. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for allowing us this privilege and this opportunity to come together. Let your word today sink deep into our hearts, minds, and our spirits. That we will become better, better Christians, better disciples, better ambassadors of yours. As we carry out the assignment that you have given us. We pray for those who may have backslidden from your presence. Pray for those who may not know you in the pardon of their sins. We pray that they will make a decision uh, to accept you, receive you, and those who are backslidden will come back to you. We thank you for this word tonight. Bless us as we continue to carry out the assignment that you have given us. As we do your will. As we be a witness for the world today. And if you're listening, if you're not saved, we want to take a moment to let you know that you can be saved on tonight by 
believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If that's you tonight, if you just pray this prayer with me and repeat after me, Lord God, I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and make me a new creature, a new creation. I receive you as Lord and Savior of my life. If you prayed that prayer on tonight, according to the word of God, you are saved. That's the first step. But I want to encourage you to make the next steps. And that is, first of all, make sure that you connect with the Bible teaching, Bible believing church. So you can know what your next steps are. And if you need us, please call us. That's Innovation Baptist Church, 850-575-0818. Or you can log on to our website, innovationbaptistchurch.org. And you can... Uh, uh, you, someone will help you along the way. If you need a replay of this message, please log on to our website and you can get the replay and you can share it. I'm running out of time on today. Thank you for sharing your time with us. We'll see you again on Sunday morning at the Sanctuary or on Facebook Live, 9.45 a.m. If you want to meet us at the church and want to be a part of our, our um, worship experience at church, we're, we're at 2150 Bellevue Way. In the city of Tallahassee, the capital of Florida, 2150 Bellevue Way, Tallahassee, Florida. Until then, stay safe, stay strong, and be blessed is my prayer.